me, I stand between you and getting home safely uh, from the snow. Thank you for inviting me and staying, staying on. When we get to peek or eavesdrop into the lives of others, we often get thrills from stuff that is different or unusual or fantastic or exotic. Perhaps that is why the internet and social media are replete with photos and videos of humans and animals performing impossible feats of floods and tsunamis and blizzards causing havoc and so on. If you're of a different generation and don't spend too much time on social media, perhaps these thrills come to you through old-fashioned novels and travel writing and documentaries on TV. One of the reasons this is interesting and fun and safe is because we are spectators with the privilege to observe but no obligation to participate other than in token waste perhaps, and sound in the knowledge that we can count on what we know and who we are, and that the rules and circumstances that apply to us are not the ones in what we are watching, but the ones with which we are familiar. And that once the show or the tour is over, we can go back to our jobs, our homes, our families, to our familiar lives. The calculation changes somewhat when we are responsible for the lives of others, when we need to do things that are meant to help make a difference in other people's lives and communities, such as when you work for government or an NGO or perhaps are a Canadian international development professional. If we are concerned and sincere, this can feel incredibly daunting because we are not just spectators but participants with the responsibility and perhaps accountability for assessing options, validating and invalidating ideas, allocating resources, and making other such consequential decisions. Here, the unfamiliar can feel disconcerting. So we search for patterns that are familiar, that which can explain things, that can turn uncertainty into recognizable narratives. Then, when we plan or approve plans, we similarly seek to establish those explanatory patterns. This is what the anthropologist Jim Scott has memorably called seeing like a state. In some cases, we construct that familiarity by matching it with our own lives, such as we design schools like the ones that we went to, our children go to, with rubrics for things like lesson plans and teacher-student ratios and classroom construction standards. Or we design legal systems with laws and courts and judges and lawyers that mimic the ones that have served us well. But in other cases, we recognize that worlds and contexts are different, that Tanzania is not Canada or Bolivia is not Indonesia, and make sense of it by creating a model of difference, still with a coherent explanation of how they do things. So, for instance, we explain that Pakistan and Nepal or Zambia are patriarchal societies, that men are in charge and want to marry their daughters early, and that is why they do not see the point of educating them. And that, that is why we need both laws and public education on the value of educating girls, for instance. Or we can take a more benign form, for example, we say that those forest communities in Brazil or Nigeria, unlike us, are not materialistic or hedonistic and are much more closely connected to the earth. They protect their forests and live sustainable lives, and our job is to empower them and protect their forests, sorry, to protect them against the forces that threaten their way of life, such as from multinational companies with names like Barrick or Shell or their own dictatorial governments led by people with names like Mugabe or Musharraf or Uribe. These narratives are compelling precisely because they have a great deal of truth to them. The patterns are borne out by evidence, discrimination and exploitation that they describe are real and lived, and the solutions we construct have a clear logic and a clear merit. 
they are doubly compelling when we discern positive intention such as through the stories in the Globe and Mail, or Nick Christoph's columns in the New York Times, or the missionary or street children NGO newsletters we get in our inboxes, that provide moving accounts of lives lived in the service of others. As easy as it may be for academics or smug critics to dismiss, dismiss these lives as naive or neo-colonial, I have found that most of us tire of cynicism and in fact find lives spent in commitment to a public purpose to be attractive and inspiring. These same features may also make international development particularly fraught. It is easy to th see through blatant lies, unfeigned bigotry, or ill motive. It is much harder when we are more than half right and generally well-meaning. But I digress. More on this later. So looking back at my own engagement and putting aside small-scale service delivery and community development projects for now, I see two main familiar tropes of international development that we engage in. In one, the government is the problem. It is failing to serve its people. These regimes may be military dictatorships, autocracies run by ethnic or money or otherwise captured elites. But in either case, they are illegitimate in the eyes of the people, or at least the majority of the people. Here, the work of international development is to empower civil society organizations to put pressure on the government, to hold it in check, by doing such activities as monitoring government abuse, publicizing its failings in relation to its commitment, and to put pressure on governments to subscribe to a template of good government, such as the rule of law, free and fair elections, free press, and so forth. In short, in this scenario, the driver of change is civil society and external pressure. An example of the archetypal organization here is something like Amnesty International at the global level, or at the community or national level, a group like Haki Elimu in Tanzania, where I worked from 2000 to 2007. That's one template. In the other template, the primary driver of change, while often fraught, is a democratically elected government who has signed on to global agreements, such as the SDGs, and made national plans to do things like make education universal, reduce infant mortality or maternal mortality, and promote good governance. <coughs> Here, the international development community seeks to support the government to bring about policy reforms, design and implement good development programs, and make budgets both better targeted for development as well as more transparent. This vision for sure includes space for civil society and for things such as freedom of expression and freedom of association. But one is prepared to be patient with the government and make compromises and turn a blind eye to some repression in the interest of the global, of the greater good that is coming around the corner. It is willing to turn a blind eye as long as the government is not too brutal in order not to burn bridges with the very government it seeks to cooperate with. And since governments are not monolithic, and individuals vary in their progressivity, one seeks to identify and work closely with the reformers or the liberal champions in government. The archetypal organization that does this kind of work is perhaps the DFID in UK, or perhaps Canadian CEDA. In practice, of course, international de development is a combination of some form of these two tropes. In both tropes, however, the core model is the same and familiar. One seeks to establish or reinforce a social compact between the state and citizens, marked by constitutional order, rule of law, liberal values, and core ideals of the sort one can find in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are healthy debates, of course, such as whether the driver of change is inside or outside government, or in the best circumstances, how can you bring these together, such as in the Open Government Partnership, which now involves 75 countries, 
and over 2,000 civil society organizations and that Canada will soon chair. And there are also debates about what's the right balance between investments in, say, social and infrastructural development, things like clinics or roads, and governance reforms, things like free elections, free press, free trade, and how the two can reinforce each other. But in all these variations and debates, the scaffolding is the same, that of the liberal democratic order where people choose their government and the government serves their people. Importantly, even where there are contradictions on what one or what one may call hypocrisy, such as when pesky protesters are locked up to make way for business, or LGBTQ communities are stigmatized and harassed, those are tolerated by mainstream international development, seen as the unfortunate price you sometimes have to pay for the greater good in the direction of the liberal order. Rarely, in my own observation, do these chinks in the scaffolding are taken as teachable moments. Not for armchair condemnations as aberrations, but as canaries in the gold mine as opportunities for deeper reflection and learning about how treacherous it is in real life to reconcile histories, interests, analyses, and visions, and of how old habits persist and new ones struggle to take hold. Instead, in my observation, in the last two to three decades, we have stayed calm and carried on, aspiring to get our work done, to best approximate the familiar tropes in our mind, seeing patterns of similarity where we can, aided and abetted by a plethora of indices that measure the progress of countries in relation to our templates. To be clear, I do not at all mean to suggest that we are naive or blind to the challenges of realizing development in practice. Every development worker worth her or his soul knows how hard it is to translate research into policy, or policy into implementation, or legal reforms into real accountability. Rather, what I mean is that the template of development of an idealized liberal social compact between the governors and the governed has remained largely intact. Until perhaps about now. In the last few years, some astonishing events, in my view, have taken place that make it increasingly untenable to stay calm and carry on with that familiar template for international development. One illuminating way, perhaps, to make sense of this phenomenon is look at the events in the founding countries of the Open Government Partnership. With the ferment of the Arab Spring as in the background, the OGP's founding was predicated on a simple idea, that you bring together the leading, one might say, inspiring democratic governments of the world, both from the kind of traditional Western leading countries, as well as the newly emerging giants in the global south, and get them to work with civil society to promote a different ideal of government, as partners working with civil society to restore and re-energize the democratic social compact. So this partnership was convened by President Obama and initially involved the governments of Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, India, the Philippines, UK, Norway, and South Africa. These countries were carefully selected using global indicators of openness as well as a political an astute political metric of how change could happen and who would be the leaders of such global change. With the understanding that they would serve as models of democratic participatory government at home and in their engagement around the world. Uh, I was a witness and participant to this process. And as limited and complicated as they were, I can attest that there was some truly important progress made through this platform such as establishing Brazil's first ever freedom of information law. 20 years of work had not achieved that and we were able to do it through the OGP. Or strengthening budget transparency in the Philippines. Or getting the US to 
publicly open up over 200,000 public data sets, or for the UK to commit to reporting beneficial ownership, who the real owners of companies are, so that corruption can be combated. So if this wonderful progress was made through these model countries and model leadership, how are we to make sense of what has happened in recent years? The fact that President Obama has been replaced by Donald Trump, that President Rousseff in Brazil was hounded out of office through a palace coup of sorts and also lost a huge amount of public support, that India has elected a leader whose roots and supporters in the RSS organization openly celebrate bigotry and misogyny, <coughs> that the progressive government in the Philippines was voted out of office and is replaced by a man who prides himself in ignoring the rule of law and killing you first and asking questions later if he finds you to be a suspect. In my own country, Tanzania, which is one of the first countries to join the OGP after the founding group. In the two years under President Magufuli, an unprecedented number of newspapers have been closed, journalists go missing, they simply disappear in the Latin American style. Opposition politicians are not allowed to have rallies or even meetings, closed door meetings such as this. Uh, they are frequently locked up and at times such as the main whip of the opposition has had an assassination attempt at 38 bullets sent through his car. You get the story. We do not know how to deal with this trope. We know what to do with regimes that force themselves into power without popular legitimacy. And we also know what to do with freely elected progressive regimes that are keen to expand democratic reforms. But the popularly elected authoritarian regime, where neither the majority of voters nor the people in power are interested in promoting liberal democratic order, <coughs> is a real problem for people like us. It's a problem because these authoritarian leaders are often so offensive in their word and in their deed. But it is even more troubling because the people who showed up at the polls voted them in. True, some have waned in their popularity today, but many others, such as Modi in India and Magufuli in Tanzania and Duterte in the Philippines, would likely be re-elected if there was an election tomorrow. And there are many, many others. After recent polls, two men indicted by the International Criminal Court are ruling in Kenya. Uganda has, in effect, a popular life president, and that's just examples from my neighborhood. South of this country, despite everything, the US Congress just voted in a hugely regressive tax law that will deeply exacerbate inequality and hurt the poor, including kicking out millions of people from basic health care. So again, how do we make sense of these phenomena? Our first impulse, I think, holding on to the familiar trope of the liberal democratic order that I think we all believe in, is to suggest that what's going on is that the state has been captured or hijacked or that people are fooled. If only money did not play such a big corrupting part in politics, or if only we could somehow regulate better the lies and misinformation perpetrated by the Russians or by Breitbart, people would know better and would not vote against their own interests. So what do we do? We rush up to shore up public media and electoral systems. We call for greater civic education and so forth. And in international development, we push for the rule of law, transparency, accountability, freedom of association, assembly, voice, and so forth. All these are undoubtedly important, necessary even. I believe in them. And at the Ford Foundation, my program and the program of my colleagues, we continue to invest heavily in these areas. But I wonder, 
whether in seeking familiar patterns that resonate with our worldviews, in seeking to explain these rather scary events, that we fail to be curious about what else is going on that may possibly shed more insight than the truth that we know. I don't have a coherent, all put together alternate account of what is going on. I tend to be somewhat skeptical of confident, comprehensive explanations. I also urge you to be similarly skeptical, because all fundamentalisms, even liberal ones, are prone to unhelpful oversimplification, and worse of all, come across as patronizing. So if that's the case, then what do we do? I want to leave you with two ideas of what those of us who care about democracy, development at home and globally could do. These are tentative suggestions. I'm not sure whether they are right. And so I welcome your critique and reactions and hopefully there'll have to be time for discussion. So first, I think the hypothesis that ordinary people, that most people, do not care about liberal democratic institutions and processes so much so that they are willing to fight for them, whether in the US or Tanzania or much of the world, perhaps Canada too, is I think increasingly true. The question is why? My hunch is that it has less to do with the fact that the people on the whole disagree with these things or with these values, and more with the fact that their experience of things associated with this liberal order, what we call international development or democracy, has not been a positive one. That the effects of globalization on jobs and job security, or the unrealized promise of, say, public education, or their experience of safety and justice and police and so forth, has failed to deliver or even made things worse. These are empirical, rather than philosophical, and deeply personal phenomena. Globalization has helped me end up in New York City with a handsomely paid job that comes with status, but not so for most Tanzanians my age that I grew up with. My white mother-in-law in New York when she sees something suspicious, she gets her comfort from calling 911 and the police. Not so for my young black friends in New York or Dar es Salaam. Our experience of criminal justice, I still can't shake off the fact that when I was an activist for street kids in my hometown of Mwanza, when I first experienced going uh, into jail, that most people there were there simply because they could not pay a $10 bail or were forgotten their files were forgotten or they stole a bike and had no connections. And the stories around criminal justice in the US I think you are more familiar with are perhaps even more cruel. I get to argue points and seek promotions at work and travel widely and enjoy walking in global metros and speak at conferences and enjoy drinks at a pub with the locals in ways that are much more fraught for many of my women colleagues. These examples have a symmetry and moral clarity to them. They are easier to navigate for when we want to be open to see our blind spots and want to be truly fair and respectful. But there are more difficult scenarios, ones where there is no such moral clarity where the differences are debatable, or ones where the other person has a view that I find abhorrent, and how, are they hard, how hard is it then not to, perhaps justifiably, but self-righteously write off the person in a manner that is ultimately uncurious and unproductive. To all these situations, I think the remedy is simple, to listen to listen better, 
genuinely, with attention, with empathy. To truly seek understanding rather than to give explanation. But as I've gotten older and more secure in my station in international development, I find that these traits are much rarer. As I think of my professional relationships now and mostly before, at work, on various boards, and my conversations with <coughs> community members, with politicians, with activists, as well as frankly when I observe the interactions of my peers, I think if we are being honest, they could hardly be characterized as models of intent listening. The systematized form of listening in international development is of course called research. But too often research becomes a right, a performance that validates what we know, providing numbers and quotes to fill up the outlines of our models, rather than a truly curious exercise of discovery that takes delight in being surprised, even where it, or perhaps especially where it messes up our templates, where it becomes uncomfortable. Doing research with integrity and using it to inform how we think and what we do is hugely consequential, sometimes literally a matter of life and death. Ruth Levine, who leads the Global Development Program at the Hewlett Foundation, has a wonderful talk about the moral case for research and evidence. I urge you to Google it and listen to it. There are also some terrific practical examples out there of how do you do listening in practice, such as my former organization, Trawezas, work in what is called Sautia Wananchi, or the Citizens Voice Mobile Phone Service in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, or the work done closer to this place around what is called the Listening for Good initiative. So that's the first idea. Second, throughout my entire talk, I have posited the challenge as how do we, international development people, help make a meaningful difference in the lives of other people. At one level, this makes sense, it's fine. After all, I'm an international development professional working for a major global foundation, talking to, I think, international development professionals in this country. All of us seek to make change, not primarily to benefit ourselves, but to benefit other people and to make the world a better place. But at another level, it's a total ruse because we know that lasting change comes not through projects and programs of the sort that many of us advise and fund, but from collective political action by people affected by how things are, banding together with allies and not so allies to form coalitions and movements for change. That organizing and movements whether they focus on pummeling governments or compelling governments to be their better selves. That they, are true, that they are the true drivers of change has been a core belief of mine for a long time. But here's the twist. Recent research by people like Harry Hahn and Peter Scotchpole in the States, for instance, suggests that our intuition that people are driven by views and positions that they come together because they care about something, such as abortion or the environment or road safety, and then pursue it collectively, may not be true. It turns out, according to this fascinating research, that the relationship may actually work in the other direction. That what happens in real life, if we are truly attuned to it, is that people come together first for often a monthly set of historical or accidental reasons. I move to your area and join your book group or your church. Or we connected because we all went to the same school, or we speak Portuguese, or we were born to expat parents, or we meet together in the video halls in Uganda because we are fans of Liverpool Football Club. Once there and together, we form views. Those views become collective and strongly held, 
brushing out nuance and doubt, and then we decide to do something about it, like march or vote or send money to our favorite cause, or in some cases paint graffiti on a mosque to tell those people to go back to where they came from. And in the course of doing so, we construct views of both ourselves and the other, and the explanations of whether the other are capable or weak, friends or foe, and how their lot is connected with our lot. And most importantly, we muster the courage of the organization needed to turn that affiliation, that identity, that tribe into action. Sometimes for good, and sometimes for harm. So what does this mean for us? Here, for a moment, it may be helpful to remind ourselves that a lot of the mechanisms and tools that we peddle in international development, and perhaps particularly human rights mechanisms, have remained elite institutions in their practice and in the experience of the public. They are mostly disconnected from the public. In reflecting on the work of Viktor Oshatinsky, Chris Stone, the former president of the Open Society Foundation, notes the following, and I quote. He quotes Victor saying, the idea of rights has seldom served the poor destitute, dispossessed, and oppressed. Such people usually do not claim rights. Instead, they ask for mercy, expect charity, and seek benefits from benevolent masters. Rights have usually been claimed by those strong enough to demand them. Christon goes on to note that Victor did not need Brexit, the Trump election, or the refugee crisis to understand how globalization has opened up a schism between human rights and the people whose poverty seemed invisible to the masters of globalization. Quote, the challenge for every advocate for democracy and human rights lies in restoring a sense of inclusion, dignity, and self-respect to the millions of people who are considered superfluous today. If that is the task, my hypothesis is that you do that, that throughout history people have done that through organizing and collective action. Not projects, not programs, not necessarily policies. If we consider, for instance, the true antecedents of the truly consequential moments in international development, such as banning slavery, the anti-colonial struggle, the fight against apartheid, the civil rights movement in the US and other parts, the environmental movement, the LGBTQ movement, and the women's movement, including its recent manifestations of the Women's March and hashtag Me Too. What does it teach us around how those changes happen and the role specifically for collective organizing? As we grapple with these large questions, how do we do the things we know and do our familiar templates stack up in terms of enabling this collective action? How do our efforts contribute to rebuilding trust in the power of civic action and in the promise of government for the public good? If we let ourselves be woke to this. It is a terrifying, unfamiliar moment. I think we can take comfort in that listening and organizing collective action are keys that we can work with. And those, hopefully, <coughs> combined with a great deal of humility and moral imagination, can help set us on the right path. Thank you for listening. <laughs>